friends and friends. Forty years. Wow. I wasn't around forty years ago. I'm not a founding member of the branch. Okay. When I joined the party, it was about a dozen years old. It was at the beginning of the Reagan era. My comrades have already talked about. I went to Washington, D.C., and I was lucky enough uh, to be at a national march and to find myself in a contingent that was so militant. It was a march against the U.S. war drive in El Salvador, uh, the buildup um, uh, in Nicaragua, the uh, support against the uh, U.S. support of the Contras in Nicaragua. And I was lucky enough to find myself in a really militant contingent. And thinking back, it was a Workers' World Party contingent. And I got a leaflet about the, uh, the days of resistance to overturn Reaganism. And one of, the, uh, one of the days of resistance was a National Student Day of protest uh, to overturn uh, the Reagan program of cutbacks, racism, and war. Well, being, you know, 21 years old or 20 years old at the time, I was very... Uh, pumped up from this national march, and I came back uh, to Michigan where I was a student at Grand Valley State out on the, the west side, and I uh, had never done such a thing before, but I'm like, oh, we've got, we got to organize a demonstration here on our campus. So, you know, with uh, n absolutely no experience, I rounded up some like-minded individuals, and we did what we had to do. And I really thought that this was part of, you know, national actions that would be taking place all around the country. And of course, it was many years later that I learned that there weren't that many demonstrations that actually occurred on that National Day of Student Protest. <laughs> but uh, one thing that happened, though, because we're part of a, of a revolutionary party, we're not a bunch of you know, lone individuals operating here and there, was that the comrades in the center in, in New York got wind that this young woman at Grand Valley State on the west side of Michigan was organizing a demonstration because I sent in a coupon from the flyer I got at the National March uh, to buy me more flyers. I'm going to have a demonstration for the National Day of Student Protest. So the party contacted the branch here in Detroit, and comrades David and Cheryl came out uh, to the demonstration at Grand Valley in April of 1982. And of course, uh, they spoke at the demonstration and came to our apartment afterwards. And like all good communists, they had literature in their trunk, and they talked to me, and we spent hours discussing politics. And, uh, you know, they continued to follow up. I, I actually moved to Ann Arbor, transferred to, to U of M. And every day when I would come home from the library, I'd ask my, uh, you know, this was in the olden days before, uh, you know, text messaging and cell phones and everything, I'd ask my roommate, did I have any messages? And it was always the same thing. That David called for you again. <laughs> David being the uh, communist organizer, you know, that he was and that he still is, you know, recognized uh, a political young woman who wanted to be involved in the struggle, who wanted to be a revolutionary, and he wasn't about to let me go. And even if he had to irritate my roommate on a nightly basis, he did that. And finally, you know, and, and, uh, later on in 1982, I joined the party, and the next year uh, moved to Detroit, and I uh, joined the branch. Now, comrades, I am just so grateful that the branch of the party that I met was the Detroit branch of Workers' World Party. Because one thing, as Comrade Jerry has, has made clear in his remarks, and that some of the statements that you heard from other comrades. One thing our branch has always been is such a working class branch, rooted in the ideological struggle of Marxism-Leninism on the side of the workers. Now, as Jerry was describing some of the many struggles that we've taken part in over the years, at the same time, and not in contradiction at all, 
that we were doing all these many mass struggles. And you know, I started listing some of them last night. And uh, there's just so many. And there are struggles that we're going to forget to even mention tonight. Uh, just too many. It used to be every year at the end of the year in December we would have like an end of the year dinner and we'd have a talk about everything that we did over the previous year. And that talk would go on for about 45 minutes or an hour. And that was just going over one previous year of struggle. So I'm not going to do that. We've heard a lot of struggles. And we're going to have a fabulous slideshow um, pretty soon where, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And Comrade David has really sort of been like our, our photographer from way, way back. Um, uh, he's put together a fabulous slideshow. So I'm not going to go into a lot of a lot of these struggles. But at the same time that we have been try we have tried as a branch to find uh, to raise um, what Jerry what is described as transitional demands and to really bring the class struggle into focus in a real way for workers and, and oppressed people. We've also realized that the only way for workers and the oppressed to win is to overturn capitalism. And it's not enough to just overturn capitalism and be done with it. We have to replace it with socialism, with a system that's based on planning to meet people's needs and not for the profits of the corporations like it is now. So at the same time that we have carried on these uh, mass campaigns for jobs to get the food distributed uh, against uh, you know, the, the anti-imperialist struggle, for prisoner rights. Um, we carried on a, a tremendous campaign even in the 1980s to free South Africa. We had, a, Ke Kevin was the, the leader of the Southern Africa Freedom Committee. We had a ribbon campaign to free Nelson Mandela when no one had ever heard of Nelson Mandela. And we had to explain to people who he was and to sign the petition to free Mandela. And we distributed thousands and thousands of uh, Free Nelson Mandela ribbons and made t-shirts, the Free South Africa t-shirts with a, now a very famous logo of the chain of the two black fists breaking the chains of apartheid. And we still screen thousands of t-shirts which raised tens of thousands of dollars which we sent um, to the African National Congress, the group which eventually um, overturned apartheid and is now in power in South Africa. Now at the same time that all this was going on, and like Jerry described, the All People's Congress took place here in Detroit. We had this wonderful mass organization. We did the Food is the Right campaign. We decided in uh, just a couple years after the All People's Congress, which happened here in Detroit, that we're going to focus more on coming out as the party. And in 1984, we petitioned just a, a small group of us and volunteers. We didn't have any paid staff or anything like that. If you've been around the branch, you know that we're, you know, we're as grassroots as you can get. We're always operating on a deficit. But we petitioned all winter long, and we got 35,000 signatures and got Workers' World Party on the ballot. Comrade Larry Holmes was our national candidate for president. Every single day, we would go out to the workers and oppressed. Uh, we'd go to um, food stamp centers. Do, do people remember food stamp centers? Nowadays, yeah. you get your bridge card in the mail, right? You're all alone. Everybody's broken up and atomized. Yeah. Back in the day, they had food stamp centers. And for the first 10 days of the month, based on your social security number, you had uh, the day that you went to get your food stamps. And there were tens of thousands of people at those food stamp centers. And that is where we got um, the bulk of the signatures to get the party on the ballot. And we would explain to people that, you know, uh, socialism means a job at a living wage. It means the right to job or income. It means housing and food and health care for all. It means an end to racism and war. And we had a very, we launched our election campaign on a military base. 
1984, where we sneaked in, when Carl Levin, who's a hawk now, and he was a hawk way back when, decades ago, he was opening his campaign uh, to support uh, his, his uh, you know, he's been a senator forever, this particular campaign. He was really drumming up support for the home troops in Nicaragua against the, uh, you know, the revolutionary So we sneaked onto this military base and we unfurled a banner and Comrade Bill Browntree was our candidate for U.S. Senate and he was right up in his face and, and Levin made the mistake of, of asking Bill, uh, well, you know, what would you do? And Bill said, I would dismantle the Pentagon and I would use that money to fund jobs <laughs> and human beings. <laughs> but our campaigns uh, were always campaigns uh, based on struggle, based on confronting the ruling class, and uh, speaking truth to power, as, as Comrade Andrea said. In 1990, <clears throat> during a very difficult time for the socialist movement with the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union and the counter-revolutionary movements happening in Eastern Europe, we decided that we needed to go back to the working class again with the message of socialism, right? The bourgeoisie was saying this is the end of socialism and we're saying no, socialism is what the workers in oppressed in Detroit and in Michigan need. And we petitioned again and got on the ballot in 1990. Uh, we ran a tremendous campaign. Comrade Bill Roundtree ran for governor and got the highest uh, vote in Michigan history uh, for a socialist candidate. And we were able to keep our ballot status uh, for three more uh, subsequent elections after that, where each time we would open up our, uh, our ticket, uh, really to, to anyone who wanted to run it. At one point we had, in 1990, I wish we had the poster up, you know, Comrade Bill led our slate of 13 comrades, a totally multinational grouping, uh, African American, Puerto Rican, white, men and women, seniors, young people. Uh, in fact, a lot of people commented that our poster kind of looked like something you find in the post office, you know, an FBI wanted poster. <laughs> we were very proud of that. Very proud of that. Um, one of the uh, one of the campaigns, uh, you know, throughout, at the time that we petitioned to campaign to get on the ballot, and during our election campaigns, we would always talk to the workers about that the problems facing the working class and oppressed really have their root in capitalism in the entire system. And while we fight for every reform or every gain every positive thing that the workers have a right to under this system. Really what we're fighting for is to overturn it all together and to build socialism. And we would engage our class knowing that working people, people like us in this room, have the capacity to understand politics, to understand what socialism is. Everybody feels in their gut what capitalism has done to the working class and oppressed. And our campaigns were able to resonate with people. Each time we would get enough uh, votes to stay on the ballot, um, we were associated. We would get media where, uh, you know, long before the idea of, you know, a, a living wage. Now there are living wage campaigns, and and uh, it's a very common. Uh, you know, even the bourgeois politicians like Obama and others have said workers need a job at a living wage. Well, back at the time, you know, in the early, uh, in the late 80s and 90s, we raised the slogan of a $10 minimum wage. And one of the things that, you know, Comrade Bill was in a, in a debate, and after the debate it was all over in the um, Associated Press coverage all over the state, was uh, that Bill Roundtree says that socialism 
means that everyone has the right to a, a living wage. And we thought, well, that's right. That's what socialism means. That's the message that we're getting out to the people. And if that's what they take away from it, that socialism means the right to a $10 minimum wage, the right to survive on a living wage, we'll, we'll take that kind of publicity. So, you know, comrades, I, I, I was going to talk a little bit about our role in inter intervening in the newspaper strike. That's a whole other other thing that we could, you know, we could have a mini conference on how the party has intervened in so many of the struggles. But I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to save that um, for the discussion. The slideshow. I hope we'll have something from the newspaper strike. Anyway, <coughs> comrades, you know, the party is not a social organization in the sense that it's not based on friendship or people liking each other, although most of us are good friends and most of us do like each other. It's about being in a struggle, <coughs> recognizing the class enemy and knowing which side that we're on. And here in Detroit, we've always been very focused on which side that we're on. And we try in whatever struggles we do, and every activity that we engage in, whether it's in the name of the party itself, or in the name of a mass organization like the Moratorium Now Coalition, we're on the side of the workers and oppressed. We're on the side of socialism. Build Workers World Party.